Turn to page 96 now, please. We have several pages here which constitute some uh, very excellent directions and advice for sponsors. But keep in mind that as we read this, and when you reread it, <clears throat> that this was written from the perspective of 1938 when there were no handy treatment centers, there was no government coming in and offering all kinds of detox facilities. And there were no courts that were sentencing people to various types of treatment and so forth. So all of the responsibility and all of the onus fell on the members of AA. So that they had a substantially greater job than we usually run into these days. There are some places in, in the United States and many in other, in other countries which are devoted to the idea of, for example, detoxing. Uh, places maintained by AA, uh, AA members, and sometimes they are clubs. Um, out west they're called Alano clubs, and in many cases they are open 24 hours a day. <coughs> and they have a couple of couches where people can shake it off. But just as 12-step as, uh, calls are few and far between these days, because the first thing that happens is somebody gets shoved into detox and or into a treatment center. and. But in the days that the big book was written, it wasn't at all unusual to go on two or three 12-step calls each week. When I came in, that was that was pretty pretty much normal. It wasn't until 1970 that the treatment centers and the detox centers started to proliferate. So a lot of this is is uh, written from that point of view. However. The basic philosophy, the basic approach remains exactly the same. The attitudes that we have to take and the, the cautions that we need to follow are very well described here. Let's go down to the last partial paragraph on page 96. He may be broke and homeless. If he is, you might try to help him about getting a job or give them a little financial assistance, but you should not deprive your family or creditors the money they should have. Perhaps you'll want to take the man into your home for a few days. Notice that that doesn't say that you're lending this person money. That's a really bad practice. If you if you're decide that, you, that he needs or she needs some money, give it to him. If you want to say anything about it, say pass it on when you can. Because creating a debt with somebody who you're trying to work with is going to create problems for both parties. But be sure you use discretion. Be certain he will be welcomed by your family and that he's not trying to impose upon you for money, connections, or shelter. Permit that and you only harm him. You'll be making it possible for him to be insincere. He may be aiding in his destruction rather than his recovery. These days we call it enabling. They didn't have that term then, that's psychobabble term, but pretty much describes what we do. And there are examples of this all over the place. I can show you 20 within, just within my limited knowledge of people who are doing exactly this with others, thinking that they're being kind and loving, thinking that they are aiding in recovery when in fact if they would read this and take it to heart they would realize that uh, they may be at helping to the destruction of this person rather than recovery. Somewhere along the line the alcoholic and the addict as well have got to begin to face their problem. 
face it squarely and become willing to do whatever it takes to find a spiritual solution. So, when it, when it says permit that and you only harm him, it means exactly what it says. This does not mean that we should be heartless or cruel. It means that we have to understand that when the big book talks about this, it tells us flat out that our troubles we think are of our own making, that they arise out of ourselves, that the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot. And people who have been on the streets for a long time, or even people who still have more or less of a home and a job, being alcoholics or addicts or both, they have learned a great deal about manipulation, about uh, working other people for what they want, never once really getting out of self, but using others to keep them going. So if you sense that that's happening, it's real important to begin to back off in a hurry. On the other hand, if, you're, if you feel certain that the person is willing to try to do the right thing, try to recover, then by all means be helpful. One of the things I've suggested here, and Billy and others have, have uh, objected to it, but I believe it to be an absolutely valid point, is that in order for us to make a considered judgment about how far we can go with somebody, how sincere they are in their recovery, one of the best things we can do is give them the book and tell them to read it. Now, I use that on a constant basis. That's the way I determine for myself if somebody is serious enough to want to spend a lot of time with them. And those who do read the big book then become people I can, I feel confident are serious about it, and they almost always are people it's easy then to work with. I believe that to be one of the main reasons that the big book instructed us on the paragraph above that we don't take them to the steps until they've read the book and said that they're willing that they want to embrace this way of life in any event whatever whatever you use as a gauge uh, or as a, a test to uh, convince yourself that the person you're working with is, is more than just a tire kicker or more than just someone who's fleeing from the vicissitudes of their lives and looking for a safe harbor, which is so often the case around here. Once you've convinced yourself that so, then of course you're gonna go all out to help them. If that means that you, if you need to help them with a couch for a couple of nights or maybe even help them with a little money or some food, that's fine. But it says to use discretion. Now, I believe that it's truism that the person who has made up their minds that they want recovery is no longer interested in being enabled. And the moment they get past that mindset that they're gonna have to work others in order to get what they need and get into the idea that they have a, that, that, that they are an alcoholic or an, and or an addict and that they need recovery and that they want recovery and they're willing to go to any lengths to get it, and by all means, go all out. Page 97. Never avoid these responsibilities, but be sure you're doing the right thing if you assume them. Helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. Take that sentence to heart, guys. It means exactly what it says. Helping others is the foundation stone of our recovery. That's what this workshop's all about. If it doesn't do anything else for the people who attend, but convince them that to, uh, to take in all the great gifts that were given and then to use them only for our own personal recovery is a terrible mistake. Bill, Bill put it best in his story, <coughs> that if we, you and I, fail to enlarge and perfect our spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, we cannot survive those certain low spots that are coming. It's just that simple. 
Now, your help for others may take many different courses. But generally speaking, the 12th step is pretty explicit, is it not? Carry this message to other alcoholics. And this message means the steps. Carry these steps to other alcoholics. That's our job. Because it's the only recovery method we have. We don't, we don't have any other way to recover and to stay recovered. A kindly act once in a while isn't enough. You have to act you have to act a good Samaritan every day if need be. It may mean the loss of many nights' sleep, great interference with your pleasures, interruptions to your business. It may mean sharing your money in your home, counseling frantic wives and relatives, innumerable trips to police courts, sanitariums, hospitals, jails, and asylums. Your telephone may jangle at any time of the day or night. Your wife may sometimes say she's neglected. A drunk may <coughs> smash the furniture in your home or burn a mattress. That happened to Bill. You may have to fight with him if he is violent. <coughs> that happened to me not too long ago. Sometimes you will have to call a doctor and administer sedatives under his direction. Of course, that's not something that we probably ever run into these days. Um, but in those days, they were they were using, um, I guess, laudanum stuff like that, uh, some opiates to calm people down. Sometimes you'll have to call a doctor and administer sedatives under direct his direction. Other time you may have to send for the police or an ambulance. Occasionally you'll have to meet such conditions. Now, reading this paragraph would probably be enough to scare a lot of people off from ever even considering doing this kind of work. And yet, had it not been done in those early days, we wouldn't be here. There'd be no way, eh? These guys were dead serious about this stuff. And that kind of seriousness is not found these, these days so often. People now really want to be handed things. And they love it when the, 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 some of the people who, who preach, um, all I want to do is be comfortable, or uh, I want to feel good. And I don't want to have to go through all this kind of stuff. And yet this, in fact, is exactly where AA got started. Think about yourself as a practicing alcoholic or addict. Some of you will remember just how difficult it you would have been to try to deal with. Especially when you were coming down from <coughs> detoxing and really wanted a drink or a drug and, and uh, knew you couldn't. The guy I had to fight with is dead now. He was a great guy. I loved him. Drank himself to death, and we found him behind a dumpster at the Walgreens store in North Miami. We seldom allow an alcoholic to live in our homes for a long time. It's not good for him. Notice that it's not good for him, and it sometimes creates serious complications in a family. Though an alcoholic does not respond, there's no reason why you should neglect his family. You should continue to be friendly to them. The family should be offered your way of life. Should they accept and practice spiritual principles, there's a much better chance that the head of the family will recover. And even though he continues to drink, the family will find life more bearable. Of course, that's the basis for Al-Anon, isn't it? And we're going to find that again when we get into the chapter for wives. But, but this, is a, this is significant in another context, guys. It shows just how far away in some respects, AA and AA groups have gotten from their from our roots, because in the in these early days they recognized the the incredible importance of family in the recovery scheme for the alcoholic. The whole chapter of the family afterwards is based on that. That this and, and the family was encouraged to participate, especially to participate in prayer and meditation, and to understand what it is the alcoholic was having to go through and the, the obligations that this, the alcoholic was going to have for 
not only his recovery, but the recovery of others who came after him, but that this was essential for him. And also to understand the <coughs> difficulty <coughs> of accepting and, and adopting a whole new way of life. And that there can be very many uh, slips along the way, not necessarily slips into use, but slips away from practicing the spiritual principles. And that the family needs to have this kind of support. Well, that just almost doesn't happen these days. And yet, uh, it isn't that far back that, that families were not only accepted at meetings, but were expected to be at meetings. I remember I was doing a big book study for the South Dade group years ago, and we took about a year and a half going through the big book, and I made a, a major pitch for the family. And so after we were through, they dedicated the next four weeks of that same session where we were doing the big book to family, and they had the families come in for those four weeks. And it was some, there was some wonderful things that came out of that, and I believe that they're still doing it. And that's the only group I know of which is making an effort to include the family <coughs> and the so-called significant others in, uh, in the recovery process, not only for their own good, but or not only for the good of the alcoholic, but also for the the wonderful good it does the family. I know my kids are AA brats. I took them to meetings all the time. There was nobody to leave them with at home. And at first I did it because I didn't know what else to do with them. But later it became apparent that this was something that was really helping them. And it has, it's stuck with them the rest of their lives. They're, both of my daughters are still major league al -Anons. Black belt, ninth degree black belts. I feel sorry for their husbands. I mean, those two girls are tough. But yet, the this, this spiritual way of life became a way of life for them. <clears throat> Why it is today that we have all these stupid closed meetings, I can never understand. There's even, they even go so far as a little eight or nine year old kid can't be in a closed meeting. And I say, well, why? Well, that's a closed meeting. Well, what are you afraid of? You're gonna go down to, to a seventh grade class and rat you out? <laughs> you tell everybody that he, he saw you here? It just, I mean, it, it's, there's no sense to it. Okay, Bob, bottom of page 97. For the type of alcoholic who is able and willing to get well, little charity, and the or notice this now. You see, here we go again. And this is the kind of, of judgment call that we as sponsors are called upon occasionally to make. For the type of alcoholic who is able and willing to get well, and again, I say to you, if you want a pretty good indication of that, get them to read the book. Little charity in the ordinary sense of the word is needed or wanted. The men who cry for money and shelter before conquering alcohol are on the wrong track. Yet we do go to great extremes to provide each other with these very things when such action is warranted. We, this may seem inconsistent, but we think it is not. It is not the matter of giving that is in question, but when and how to give. That often makes the difference between failure and success. The minute we put our work on a service plane, notice the use of the word service here, don't let that throw you. We talk about being in service, but here it's, it has the connotation of a servant, not AA service, but being a servant. The minute we put our work on a servant plane, service plane, the alcoholic commences to rely upon our assistance rather than upon God. Now this is one of the most critical aspects of sponsorship that we need to, we have to remember. We cannot permit our sponsees to become dependent upon us. This is one of the worst mistakes that we can make. And there are many people who are known as heavy-duty sponsors whose, whose 
prime methodology is to make their sponsees absolutely dependent upon them. And this is, this is uh, sponsorship by ego. And this, this stuff, I mean, if you don't call me every day, I'll fire you. You don't make any moves without <coughs> calling me. You know, if you need to go to the bathroom, call me. You think that's, you think that's too silly? I'm not sure it is. Oh dear, you've been having difficulty with your bowel movements? Let me know as soon as you get the urge. I'll be right there to hold your hand. Take a pill. We must make sure that the alcoholic we're working with is being prepared to stand on their own two feet at the very earliest moment they can do so. And then it, from there on it is going to be between them and God this doesn't mean that we back away in terms of being available to be helpful, not at all. It means that we do not engender dependency in the people we sponsor, nor do we allow them to take on that role themselves. Now there is another very good reason, aside from the health of the sponsee, our health is at stake because this business of dependency is a two-edged sword. And when we're spending our time uh, engendering dependency in the people we sponsor, what we are really doing is dedicating our life not to the service of God and the people about us, but to our own aggrandizement, to our, the validation of our worth as a human being through the agency of other human beings precisely the thing we have to avoid. And so as quickly as you can, get your sponsee standing on her own two feet. Right, Diane? Right. You know what I mean, don't you? <coughs> yep. This is what we do. Same with you, Peach. You're on your hind legs a lot of these days, I know that. Secret agent girl. <laughs> And this is something where we can be extremely effective in doing so. Because we concentrate on this. We concentrate on the, on the, the, the development in our sponsees of the, of the kind of relationship with God which will reduce their fear quotient and increase their self-esteem and their feeling of worth, worth, being worth, worthwhile people. We teach them how to do things so that they will feel successful, so that when they go to bed at night, they can look back on their day and say, I did the right thing today. I did what was in front of me to be done today. I did not try to dictate the terms and conditions myself. I left the results up to God. I didn't harm another person. And I can look back on that day and regardless of the, regardless of the outcome, regardless of the, of the results, I can see that as a, as a very successful day. Because I backed completely away from the idea that I'm running the show. Teach your sponsees that the third step prayer means exactly what it says. That is an offer of life and will to God without reservation to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Not as I want, but as thou wilt. And that's something which we are granted. We get to have that, but it doesn't last very long if we fight with it. If we insist that for example, with our bright-eyed friends who tell us, oh, you have to balance your life. The moment we start balancing our life, we have to take charge again. And people say, well, get a life, which really means that you're probably becoming an AA junkie. And I don't like it because you aren't going fishing with me enough anymore. But you're not spending enough time paying attention to me. It's just like this thing about the pink cloud. That, that whole thing was invented by people who don't like seeing other people happy. 
it's all a bunch of crap. Why in the world wouldn't you be happy if you if you realize that you've got victory over alcohol? Mm. That your low life has changed. That you got God in your life, that He's smiling on you, you're getting all these gifts. <laughs> you got all these miracles worked in your life. Who in the world wouldn't be happy with that? Pink cloud my butt. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, Jim, before you go on, uh, yeah, I'm listening to everything you say. I agree with it because it's all written here. Yes. But what I've been seeing going on, and this is a recent phenomenon, okay, and I've been coming around here a while, but I haven't seen it. A lot of the stuff you said, I've heard people pick up this big book, and I guess it is a disease of denial, but they would read, okay, and I've heard this, I mean, basically heard this, okay, that what you just said would be read. He may be broken homeless. If he is, you will help him about, get, about getting a job or give him financial assistance. Then go to page 97, okay? Uh, we allow the alcoholic to live in our homes. Go up. We seldom. Uh, I'm leaving out words. This oh. is what I'm getting at. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Never avoid these responsibilities, but be sure you're doing the right thing. You assume them. Helping others is the foundation stone of, of your recovery. Okay. Okay, and I hear a lot of that twisting going on. Yeah. Not only in this book, but in the 12 and 12. It's called selective reading. Yes. Yeah. Now, in other words, I've got this big book memorized because I've read it 375 times. Now, I'm going to take everything that's going to make me, you know, that fits me. I'm not going to read it in context. I'm going to read it totally out of context. Okay. So it fits my need, and I can justify to myself, well, I'm doing God's will. It's in the big book. Of course. I think, I think that, that <laughs> I'm glad you pointed it out, Mike, because that illustrates a very important fact. The big book is perhaps the most dense writing you'll ever pick up. It is encapsulated in 164 pages of text, and in 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 uh, ordinary print and 30 pages in italics are there's a there is enough here that it would be very easy to expand it to 10 volumes and so what we have to do is we have to learn to read the big book by parsing each sentence we take it word for word word by word You've noticed that when when uh, I'm using the big book, that I will I will point out each word as we go through a sentence sometimes because each word is becomes critical. Mm -hmm. Each phrase is important. Every sentence is important. Every paragraph is important, and everything in this big book dovetails with everything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not only that. But everything in this big book is consistent with everything else. You won't find a single inconsistency in it. There's only one lie in the big book. We're going to get that to that when we get to the eighth chapter. It's the only lie. Bill Wilson pretending to be a woman. <laughs> but what he says is not a lie. All right, now we're coming down to some stuff that is of critical importance. Remember? that the alcoholic commences to rely upon our assistance rather than upon God. And that is shame on us if we allow that to happen. He clamors for this or that, claiming he cannot master alcohol until his material needs are cared for. How many times have we heard that? Now here comes something. This, this is AA trivia. The shortest sentence in the big book is coming next. The word nonsense. And I'll tell you why it is the shortest. Because it only has eight letters. Obviously. And obviously on page 45 has nine letters. Yeah. There's some trivia for you. Nonsense. Now people get really uptight when I use words like that because they think that, that <coughs> we're supposed, you know, AA today, so much of it is, it has been watered down to a point where everything has to be relative. You see, we want to get into this gray area where there are no rules. You ever heard anybody say there are no musts in the big book? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are 30, 64 of them. And you know what must means in the big book? Or else. Or else. Or 
Well, she died. Sure, take. I'll show you something, so you don't think I'm lying to you. Let's go back. I don't. And I don't usually lie. Go back, please. Where is that? I thought I had it. Oh, well, never mind. It'll come to me. There is that, that exact statement is made. I thought it was in the beginning of chapter 6, but I find it's not. Oh, we're on, <laughs> yeah. We're on 98. Now then, nonsense on page 98. First full paragraph, five lines up from the end of that paragraph. Here is ultimate truth. Some of us have taken very hard knocks to learn this truth. Job or no job, wife or no wife, we simply do not stop drinking. Notice that. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is not some kind of nice little thing. Oh, we sort of maybe won't sort of like get sober for too long. It's, we simply don't stop drinking. So long as we place dependence upon other people ahead of dependence on God. Mm -hmm. And notice where this is coming. This is not coming in something out here as just a, a, a disconnected phrase, it's referring specifically to us as sponsors or people who are trying to do 12-step work. Do not allow the person you're working with to become dependent upon you. Their entire dependence must be upon God. Mm -hmm. And if you allow them to become dependent upon you, you harm them and you harm yourself. Next paragraph. Burn the idea into the consciousness of every man that he can get well regardless of anyone. Mm -hmm anyone the only condition is the trust in God and clean house yeah. now if you want to know about first things first that's first things first <laughs> please ask it um, I, I have someone that I was working with and he was on his, he's been on his four step for about quite a while and I would say about three months it's, it's been since he's done the fourth and decided to take the fifth and he kept getting excuse after excuse while I'm on probation and the stuff that I have to talk to I have to talk to a priest about and I have to make sure that I have a job and I have to make sure that I have a house and that I have a job to because I have to have an address and there's people I owe money to and I, I, I have to do these things. It is an obligation. It is my responsibility, and I have to do this. And I was looking for this page to point out to him, uh, but I, I couldn't seem to find it. But um, I was getting a lot of that, and then I was getting a lot of, well, you're an authority, you're uh, being an authority. And then I started being criticized about how I was reading how it works, and all of a sudden I was being, you know, for being taking this program serious and saying, look, you know, if you don't put uh, sobriety first, you're not going to have anything else. So I don't know. It's just like I couldn't seem to get anywhere. But um, well, you want to know how to test him? You tell him you want the name of that priest by Friday. Well, the thing was. Wait, um, wait, wait. Look, let me finish. <laughs> you tell him I want the name of the priest by Friday. <coughs> Because I'm going to write a letter to that priest, tell him how to take a, take your fifth step. Because there's a lot of stuff he ain't going to know that has to come out in a fifth step. So bring me the name of the priest by Friday. <coughs> and when Friday comes and goes, you're probably going to be able to say, look, I think it'd be a good idea for you to find somebody to work with that you yeah. feel more comfortable with. Okay. So how do you feel about you know putting obligations first? That was like the question because that was basically what I was Well, to well, that's just an excuse because he doesn't want to do a fist step. He's scared to death of doing a fist step. Mm -hmm. He does he not want to do it. He, maybe he doesn't want to do it with you because he's going to have to tell you a bunch of stuff that is going to embarrass the hell out of him. And maybe you're just too young and good looking and he's afraid of that. But you, so that's why I'm telling you, you tell him you go find that priest, that monsignor, that bishop, whoever's going to do it, bring me his name and his and his address, and I'm going to write him a letter so that he'll know how to take a first step. That's what the big book tells us to do. we got to make sure the 
the person we're giving the fist up with knows what we're what we're getting after, what we're what we're doing here. The priest is going to think it's some kind of uh, just ordinary garden variety confession, and that's not the point at all. We are confessing our faults, but there's a purpose behind it that has to be brought up. We got the sixth step and the seventh step coming up. That means we got to look at these defects in our fifth step. And we have to see how deadly they are, mm -hmm. how cancerous they are. Mm -hmm. We got to see that we can't get rid of them ourselves. We're powerless over them. Yeah. We got to see that, that we need God's help, and then we got to be come convinced <coughs> that we are going to ask His help to be freed from these defects. That all has to happen in the fifth step. Mm -hmm. And somebody who's doing that, taking a fifth step, doesn't know that is going to miss the, the point entirely. So that's what you do. Don't be afraid to to put. You know, put the saddle on his back and tell him, look, this is the way it's got to be. You want to do it with a priest, that's fine. Bring me his name and his, and his address and phone number because I need to give him some information <coughs> that he when he does this. Well, then I got, well, um, I'm, it's your way of saying, well, I'm not going to do it. It's your opinion and it works for you. You might kill somebody else. And that's what I said. Well, it sounds to me like you don't have much of a prospect there, kiddo. <laughs> You you may you may you may want to just you may just want to say bye bye to that person. All right, we're going to take it. Yes, excuse me, Tom. Go ahead. Quiet, please. I worked with somebody the once when I I was an employee when I was about two three years sober, and uh, if somebody wants what I have, and you know they want me employable, they're going to do what I did to get that way. If they don't want to get employable, they don't want to keep a job or anything. I'm not the person to get to be a sponsor. Well, if they don't want to get a job, keep a job, they aren't going to stay sober anyway. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, you know, you you don't want to beg the question there. How can I give hey, something I haven't got? Right. Let yes. Me, let me ask a question on the, the sponsee or sponsor or sponsee yeah. side of this. When you get a sponsor, you ask somebody to be a sponsor. I've found this so many times with me that they want me to put them up on a pedestal. They want what? They want me to put them up on this pedestal. Well, well you better run well, like I mean, hell. Yeah, but then they say you're not working. You're not working. You, you know, if you aren't willing to go to any length, I've had this thrown at me. What I want you to do, call me every day. Uh, yeah, bye -bye. You, you know what I'm saying? I want you to call me every day. I want you to don't don't get into a relationship. Uh, if you got problem with work, you call me and you talk to me about work. If things ain't going at your house, and I'm thinking, and they're thinking, man, what in the hell? You ain't. I, I, I never listened to a cop, let alone listen to you. You know, authority sucks with me. I'm so undisciplined, as the book says. And I mean, I show it, and I get so rebellious when when a sponsor says that. Okay, to me. here's what you do. Okay. Because we're talking about you as a sponsor now. I don't give a damn about these people that you got tied up with. If you don't like them, get rid of them. Find somebody who makes sense. But here's what you do. You've got a new person sitting in front of you. Mm -hmm. You look them in the eye and you say, here's the deal. I'm going to tell you what to do and you're going to do it. And you're not going to drag your feet. And you're not going to give me any excuses. But what I'm going to tell you how to do is to work 12 steps. But I promise you that I will show you every step along the way exactly what you're doing, where to find the big book, and how to go about doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, I and I'll promise you one more thing. If you cooperate with me, and if I will do what I said, and I promise you that once you've completed the steps, you will be just fine. Now, how does that sound to you? And the people who agree with that, I say, okay, let's go get them. Now, that if that makes me a step Nazi, I can't help it. It's the only way I know that it works. Because if you pussyfoot around about this stuff, all you're doing is you're doing the same stuff that happened with them before. Some people have been letting them slide all this time. They've been getting away with it. They figured out how to manipulate, how to make, how to take the easier, softer way. There's only one way. We only have one way. We don't have any other way. And if people want recovery, they're going to have to work this if they want me to help them. Because I don't know anything else about recovery. I don't have any pills. I don't know a psychiatrist I would trust longer and farther away and I could push him. <laughs> I know that the, 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 uh, the, the shots and the pills don't work, usually. So this is what we have. Yeah. Now, if somebody wants recovery, and they say that they want recovery, and they, they read the big book, go back to page 96, let's see what it says. Middle paragraph. 
middle paragraph. This is so important. We got in this last week in a big discussion. But this is what the book says. This is what I do. And this is what I'm teaching you to do. And it's up to you whether you want to do it or not. Suppose now you're making your second visit to a man. He has read this volume. Notice that's the second visit. And says he is prepared to go through with the 12 steps to the program of recovery. That's the key. In other words, we read it at every meeting. What what is it? What is the phrase? You remember it? If you want what we have. If you want what we have. If you have decided that you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you're ready to do what? Then right now. Yeah. 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 Huh? Oh, twelve. That's twelve. <laughs> Bottom of page 98, top of page 99 talks about the family problems. Now these are discussed in much greater detail in chapter 9. But uh, basically what it's saying is that the, uh, the family and the alcoholic are going to have to find some way to get along. And the way that the, eventually the way they do that is at least according to the big book, is that the family decides that they'd be willing to do something with the steps themselves. And that's entirely consistent with what we find in chapter 8 in the chapter to wives because it's there the wives found out that this was true. They needed to work 12 steps themselves. I mean, this is, this is almost never done these days. And yet it's one of the, it's one of the most uh, profound observations in the big book the family which would which which works the 12 steps together and prays together and meditates together as a family that just was able to solve most of their problems and, and with God's grace mm. had first full paragraph page 99 after they have seen <coughs> tangible results the family will perhaps want to go along those these things will come to pass naturally in a good time provide however the alcoholic continues to demonstrate that he can be sober considerate and helpful regardless of what anyone says or does now you got to teach your sponsees how to deal on a new basis with their family and with their employers and the people they work with and even the people in AA for guys sakes the Teach them to be slick, soft-spoken, loving, considerate, and kind. And no matter what they do, no matter who they're with, teach them that they have tremendous influence on their environment. That the way they act and the, and the way they conduct themselves and the attitudes that they demonstrate are going to have an enormous impact on the way other people treat them and the other way other people react to them. It's, and it's especially true in the family. And it's, it's so good to learn to say, hmm. <laughs> or, okay. <laughs> you want to you know the secret to get along with your boss, learn to say, okay. In just that tone of voice. And when somebody's being particularly obnoxious, and you're saying, hmm, doesn't seem to work too well, you go like this. What are you doing? Well, I'm praying for you. <laughs> if that if that doesn't work, then you do this again. You say, what are you doing? You say, well, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I'm praying for the patience to wait around long enough to see what he's going to do to you. <laughs> we need to have a new attitude toward all this stuff. Yeah. What happened? Look, let's go back. Let's go back to the basics. Just before we get to the third step prayer. So our problems we think are of our own making. Yeah. They arise out of ourselves, and the alcoholic is a <coughs> extreme, extreme example. Yes. Extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Yeah. <laughs> This has got to be burned into the consciousness of everybody we, we work with. 
Now, when they look in the mirror, they've got to be able to mumble to themselves, I'm looking at the problem. Yeah. I am the problem. Mm -hmm. There is a there is a phrase in the ninth chapter. Here we go. All right. We're getting close now, guys. Here we go. Getting closer. Getting further away. Remember that when you were a kid, they used to play that game, getting warm, getting cold? Okay, here's what it says. On page 133. Second line. We are sure God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. We cannot subscribe to the belief that this life is a veil of tears, though it once was just that for many of us. But it is clear we made our own misery. God didn't do it. Now these are tough things, because you've got to remember that the person you're working with has been lied to all their life. Not that the lies were deliberate necessarily, but they were they were instructed about how to live their life by people who never <coughs> learned themselves. And so they came to believe sincerely that if they wanted to be happy and secure in their in their life, they were gonna have to have an education, they were gonna have to make money, they were gonna have to accumulate things, they're gonna have to learn to control people, and when people came into their ambit they were that they needed to take them captive and make sure that they did exactly as they were told to do. That they that they had to have this career, and they had to make lots of money and accumulate all this stuff. And the, and he who dies with the most toys wins. And and the problem there is that that never worked. It was a it was a false premise to begin with. It was a lie to begin with. It never worked. And so the because this stuff never worked. They got more and more unhappy. Then they went to the psychiatrist mm -hmm. or the counselor mm -hmm. who told them that the real reason that they were so unhappy was not because of the crapped out actions they were taking, but because mm -hmm. somewhere back in their childhood somebody said something, <laughs> did something, didn't do something that has caused all of this heartache and all of this problem that, that they're not responsible because they have been the victims of adversity and they have been the victims of other people and the alcoholic loves this because by by virtue of having that that's a great excuse for continuing to go directly against what they know to be right and wrong alcoholic and addict is a person almost always who is violating their own sense of morals and ethics mm -hmm. They're taking crapped out action and excusing it, and, and, and many of the human solutionists have given them built-in excuses for this. You have to deal with this w w with a lot of your newcomers. It's just a fact. And sometimes it's real hard to get past that because it's so comfortable to believe that the wrongdoing of others has caused all of my grief and, and is the excuse and the rationale for the things I do. And then some of these human solutionists will say to things like, well, there is appropriate anger. I mean, everybody gets angry sometimes. And yet for alcoholics, anger is a poison. I mean, is there appropriate strychnine, for God's sake? <coughs> and, and, and everybody, oh, fear. Now, here's another one. They, they love to come up with this. He healthy fear. Now, how can something which is a personification of the devil be healthy, mm, yeah. ever? Mm. Fear is a product of our minds, of our sick minds. And fear is the absence of faith. Yeah. And if you are dealing with fear, you are not trusting God. Mm. How in the world can that ever be healthy? How about self-will? <laughs> self-will, of course, is a, is a product of fear as well. Because yeah. you see, if I'm living in self-will, it means that I am afraid to let God do it. I'm afraid not to be in control because I've been taught that I have to constantly control my life. Okay, then it goes on. Let's go down. Uh, 
to the bottom of page 99. Four lines up from the bottom. Let no alcoholic say he cannot recover unless he has his family back. Mm -hmm. This just isn't so. In some cases, the wife will never come back for one reason or another. Remind the prospect that his recovery is not dependent upon people. It is dependent upon his relationship with God. Yeah. That is so basic. That is so basic. And this is what we keep forgetting. Because when you get into human solutions, the relationship with God becomes irrelevant. Start doing it yourself again. We have seen men get well whose families are not returned at all. We've seen others slip when the family came back too soon. Mm -hmm. Now then, this next sentence is the whole is, is, is sponsorship in one sentence. And it's the only place in the big book which clearly defines sponsorship. And the word sponsorship, of course, is never used because they didn't have sponsors in those days. Both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. Yes. Notice it isn't you and a group. It isn't you and the mob. And, and one, of the, one, of the, one of the most dangerous things we say around here is this is a we program. Why do, we, why do we say that? Because we is the first word of the 12 steps, and we is implied in all the other steps. Is that why we say that? I don't know. Did anybody stop to think about it? What does this really mean? It says we, it means we, us individually, did this. Because there's nobody is implying that they all sat down and did a fourth step together. It doesn't mean they all sat down and did a fifth step together. They certainly didn't follow each other around as they made amends. It means we, each of us individually, did these things. Now, the unity of the fellowship is of extreme importance, no doubt about it. Personal recovery depends upon that. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are people who need to have this program because it supplies us with things which we would have great difficulty having otherwise. It isn't that no one can recover without a group because certainly people have. There are those who are totally isolated and have no groups to go to. They have no one around and they, they do recover and they learn to follow spiritual principles. Mm -hmm. But remember that the basis upon which AA was founded was one alcoholic working with another. Go back to Bill's story, we'll see where it all began. In Bill's story, as he lay in the hospital, he was inspired to understand that there would must be thousands more alcoholics out there who could profitably use what he had been given. And he talked to Abby about it, and Abby said, Yes, Bill, faith without works is dead. And how appallingly true, Bill says, for the alcoholic for if the alcoholic fails to enlarge and perfect his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he can't survive the certain low spots ahead. So everything is based upon one-on-one. -on -one. Read When we read the first part of this chapter, nowhere does it say that this new person was accosted by a group of, of AAs, all of whom were trying to prove who was the most powerful program. It was one person. It says... Get them alone if possible. Get them alone. Why? Because the basis of sponsorship is two people walking day by day in the path of spiritual progress. Notice that this is not a, 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 a this is not a, a spiritually arrogant sponsor who has nothing to gain but is condescending to spend their their valuable time with this poor benighted newcomer who is now going to profit so mightily by having been the, given the opportunity to rub elbows with this grand guru. It doesn't mean that at all. Because if I don't have the, if I'm not honored by you with the opportunity to pass on what I've been given, I die. Yeah. You got me somewhere here, Jim. And I agree with you 100% most of the time. But one and one equals two, which is plural, 
which is not me, it's we. Now, I've always learned I can't do this by myself. I can't keep it if I don't give it away. If you want to use the, the duality as we, I can't disagree with you. If that's, if that's what you mean by saying we, I doubt very seriously if that's the use of the term in these rooms. But if that's what you mean by it, I have no disagreement with you whatsoever. Thank you. Of course, that's the basis of the program. Pat. Um, on the page of about 100, it says, assuming we are spiritually fit. That we means I. It doesn't mean that this whole book has to be spiritually fit. Right. For me to have a career or pass it on. That so means that we, each of us individually. Individually, yeah. the yeah. same as in step one. Well. That's you know, right. That's what that word we I know. Yeah. And, and, and I don't have to worry about the whole room being spiritually fit. Without you me. got it. And they use the word we. You got it. Yes. Um, John. Where is that um, the reference to that? Um, for unless we, uh, if an alcoholic fails to uh, expand their spiritual life. With Bottom of page 14, top of page 16. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Now this paragraph on page 100, the first full paragraph, is worthy of meditation. I suggest to you that you may wish to teach this to your sponsees as one of those paragraphs in the big book, which they will go to occasionally in their morning meditation. Both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. If you persist, remarkable things will happen. When we look back, we realize that the things which came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. Follow the dictates of a higher power, and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world, no matter what your present circumstances. Now that's really powerful stuff. And it happens to be absolutely true. You see, it does not matter from whence your sponsee came, nor does it matter from whence you came. Mm -hmm. I, I sponsor people who, who have such a kaleidoscope of backgrounds that it would be impossible to categorize them in any way, except that each of them is a sick and suffering alcoholic when they get here, or drug addict, or both, and each has reached a place where they no longer are willing to go on suffering as they have been and have decided that they want what they find in here. And so the 12 steps work for everybody without discrimination based on any other criteria <coughs> other than the fact that we want recovery. The 12 steps work for people who have no addiction. It, work, it works fine for people who simply want a better way of life. I've taken a lot of people through the steps who are not addicts or alcoholics. Yeah. Let no one say that you cannot work with someone who is not an alcoholic or an addict. That's just not true. The criteria is that they be sufficiently motivated to be willing to work the steps to become honest with themselves. Mm -hmm. If they are, they can do it. And that's exactly what the wives found when they were going to meetings with the husbands that though none of them were alcoholics or addicts, they, they found out that the 12 steps worked just as well for them. Because, let's, let's see why that should be. These 12 steps are, are spiritual principles, which have been around forever. <coughs> When I wrote 12 Steps for Christians, I went through the Bible to find out what's the background of these steps. About over over half of the, the steps, we, I found the, the references mainly in the Old Testament. But then, of course, if you look in the book of James and so forth, but you'll find the same things in the Koran. You'll find the same things in the teaching of Buddha and the Shinto teachings. You'll find these principles have always been known so long, for as long as man began to recognize that there were powers out there greater than themselves 
especially when they came to believe that these powers were beneficent and not simply terror, terrible things that were out to get them. But what's the difference? Why are the 12 steps different? Why is it that people have extreme difficulty getting sober in church? No action. Or synagogue, or wherever. Do you know, John? No action. That's right. Because there they are taught that these are the wonderful things they ought to be. Mm -hmm. These are the things, ways that you ought to act. These are the things you ought to think. These are the attitudes you ought to have. But nowhere are they told how to do it. You see, the genius of the 12 steps is that it takes these great spiritual principles and, and restates them as steps of action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that when we take the action, we incorporate these principles into our lives. They become a part of our very being. That's what it means to practice these principles in all of our mm -hmm. affairs. And the word practice, by the way, in the 12 step, does not mean like going out on a practice field it means practice like a doctor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You would hope that the doctor operating on your heart was not just practicing. <laughs> <laughs> so practice in this sense means use, yes. do, <coughs> perform. Mm -hmm. All right. Now let's go down to the bottom of page 100. Here we come into some stuff that directly contradicts so much of the established wisdom, if I can use that word, around the rooms. Assuming we are spiritually fit, we can do all sorts of things alcoholics are not supposed to do. People have said we must not go where liquor is served, we must not have it in our homes, we must shun friends who drink, we must avoid moving pictures which show drinking scenes, we must not go into bars, our friends must hide their bottles, we must think, not think or be reminded about alcohol at all. In other words, what is the modern concept? Well, you guys stay away from old playpens and playmates. Why? Because you'll drink if you go there. Oh, yeah, and that's right. That's right. That's, that's exactly what you're going to do. Assuming what? To get a haircut and hang out the bar. Assuming what? If you're not spiritually. Oh, right. okay. See that? Now, uh, as Shakespeare would say, that, aye, ah, that's the rub. Aye, <laughs> ah, that's the rub. If we are spiritually fit, let's go on. We meet these, on page 101, we meet these conditions every day. An alcoholic who cannot meet them still has an alcoholic mind. In other words, is walking around with untreated alcoholism. Mm. And that means there's something the matter with his spiritual status. Why? Because, you see, our recovery is entirely dependent upon establishing a certain relationship with our higher power. That's a relationship of surrender mm -hmm. and obedience. Mm -hmm. And when we have reached that relationship, and if we maintain it, we're in God's pocket. We can do any thing we want as long as our motive is right. That's right. His only chance for sobriety be someplace like the Greenland ice cap and even there an Eskimo might turn up with a bottle of scotch and ruin everything. Right. Ask any woman who has sent her husband to distant places on the theory he would escape the alcohol problem. Listen to this now. In our belief any scheme of combating alcoholism which proposes to shield the sick man from temptation is doomed to failure. If the alcoholic tries to shield himself, he may succeed for a time, but he usually winds up with a bigger explosion than ever. We have tried these methods, these attempts to do the impossible have always failed. I want you to go back to page 85 now, please. I want to show you something there. We've just learned that we've been restored to sanity. We're at the top of the page. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That's the miracle of it. We're not fighting it. Neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we've been placed in position neutrality, safe and protected. 
we have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. That's why on page 101, it tells us that these attempts to shield ourselves or the sick person have always failed because this isn't about not drinking. Nowhere in the big book does it say don't drink. Not one word, don't drink. What it says is you can't drink successfully again. That's in the doctor's opinion. Mm -hmm. Not one word, don't drink. Why? Why would I tell Mike here, who is a sick alcoholic, a chronic alcoholic, he's got the disease up to yin yang, and I go to, I go to Mike and I say, Mike, don't drink, Mike, and go to meetings, Mike. Now, Mike's going to say to me, if I could not drink, what the heck do I need you for? <laughs> what do I need to go to meetings for? Well, you, if you go to meetings, meeting makers make it, me, meeting makers <laughs> make it, make it, I don't know what it is. <laughs> so the big book doesn't <laughs> indulge itself in any fantasies about how we can suddenly acquire all this new willpower that we didn't have before. How all of a sudden, it doesn't mean what it says when it says that we're powerless over alcohol. That we cannot stop drinking on our own. It doesn't mean it when it says that we have only two choices. We can either go on to the bitter end or we can accept a spiritual solution. doesn't mean that at all. What it really means is, don't drink, Mike, and go to meetings. And even if your butt falls off, put a little red wagon and drag it to a meeting. <laughs> yeah, glue your ass to the chair. Oh, yes. And if you can't remember your last drunk, you haven't had it. And what was it? what's that other one? I can't remember. You see, nobody, anybody who says that is taking a terrible risk that the person they're talking to may very well have had their last drunk in a total blackout. Not ever going to remember it. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Okay. So, our rule is not to avoid a place where there's drinking if we have a legitimate reason for being there. Now, notice that when you get to the 11th and 12th steps, you get to take a PhD in recovery, which means that now motive becomes extremely important. And whereas before, we, the big book wasn't concentrating on motive, we, was, apparently they didn't, get, they didn't overload their circuits that much when they were working the steps. But by the time we get to the 11th step and the 12th step, motive becomes real important. And the reason for that is simple. We can do the right thing for the wrong motive, and it's just as damaging and dangerous for us to do the wrong thing. Amen. Okay, so now we're going to have to be not only aware of our actions we're not, and, and, of, and of the defects which are creeping in, but we're going to have to also be aware of our motives for doing what we're doing. And, and if we think back on our drinking and drugging careers, we realize that we had some really terrible motives for the things that we did. I mean, we... Motive was something which drove us to do things which were clearly against our, our, our scruples, against our, our sense of right and wrong, against our sense of morality and our sense of ethics. So what we're learning here is that we can even go to plain ordinary whoopee parties now that's not a party which has these funny cushions when you sit on them they make a noise. A whoopee party in the 1930s was with flappers and bathtub gin and everybody putting a lampshade on their head and doing the uh, Charleston. That was a whoopee party. Now, I like the idea of whoopee parties, actually. In fact, when, <laughs> when I ask people if there are any announcements, uh, commercial announcements for AA, I always ask them if you, if you want to uh, announce a bingo party or a whoopee party or bowling alley, you know, whatever, fishing. Okay, you will note that we've made an important qualification, page 101. Therefore, ask yourself on each occasion, have I any good social, business, or personal reason for going to the play, this place, or am I expecting to steal a little vicarious pleasure from the atmosphere of such places? <coughs> and so this is really telling us that, our, that we, we can delude ourselves into thinking, oh, I can go down to my local bar hangout where they've been keeping the scoop stool warm for me and I can sit down and have a, a, a soda 
and everybody will come over and, and tell me how wonderfully I'm doing and how glad they are to see me and they really miss me. Well, there are a bunch of drunks in there and, and the, the misses maybe for 30 seconds, yeah. 30 yeah. minutes at the outside. These are people, as we were, totally centered on themselves. But it's our own imagination that we need to go back and make sure that they understand we still love them because after all, we spent a good part of our lives in there and most of our fortune. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I want to run over just a few minutes. I hope nobody minds because I want to finish this chapter. Is that okay? Someone had something to say, Jim. All right, now listen to this. On the bottom of page 102, the last full paragraph. Your job now is to be at the place where you may be of maximum helpfulness to others. So never hesitate to go anywhere if you can be helpful. You should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth on such an errand. Keep on the firing line of life with these motives and God will keep you unharmed. When I was coming before the judge four years ago to be sentenced, and I didn't know what was going to happen, the U.S. Attorney wanted me to spend another year and a half in prison at least. And the judge was very skeptical about what the U.S. Attorney was proposing, but he turned to me and he said, do you have anything to say? And I said, yes, Your Honor. He had 50 letters from people in AA sitting in front of him. Mm -hmm. He said, "My the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me to keep on the firing line of life. And that's all I want to do. He said, well, I think you better do that. And he turned to the U.S. Attorney and said, this is, a, this is an outrage. I'm letting this man go right now. Okay. And I walked out of there. Oh, man. I saw, I saw the prosecutor. I saw the prosecutor about an hour later as I was paying my hundred dollar court costs or something. And I went over and, and gave her a great big hug and I told her I loved her. And she almost crapped on the floor right there. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. One of uh, this uh, what's her name? This ex attorney general we've got hanging out now in Florida. What's her name? Janet. Yeah, Janet Reno, one of her little girls. Part of her uh, Gestapo. <laughs> okay. Let's go down now to the last paragraph on page 103. Whenever we see stuff in italics, it means that Bill at least thought it was extremely important. After all, our problems were of our own making. Mm -hmm. Boy, is that ever important. Yeah. Bottles were only a symbol. Mm -hmm. Besides, we have stopped fighting anybody or anything. We have to. And when somebody wants to fight, what do we do? We say, hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or okay. <laughs> or even if you wish, gosh, I, I really hear what you're saying. That's pretty interesting. Now, tell me, how can I be helpful to you? You want to pull all their fangs, man, you can do it. You just have to know how to go about it. There's no point in ever, ever getting into confrontations. If somebody's trying to beat you up, of course, you got to beat them back, but I'm not talking about that. I was talking to a sponsee of mine yesterday, and there's a guy around here who loves, loves, loves to pick on me. I don't know why it is. He decided he, decided he didn't like me right from the beginning, and every chance he gets, he puts a knock in. He doesn't do it to my face. He goes to the, the, the uh, Twisted Servants meeting every month and goes something like that. Yeah. I like that meeting. That's why I like it. Twisted Twisted. Yeah. Or, he, or he, will, he will try to figure out something to, to contradict anything I share. And so a friend of mine is very defensive of me and he, he wanted to beat this guy up or something. I said, no. <laughs> he said, what, what are you doing about it? I said, I don't do anything about it. You gotta remember, AA is a self-cleaning oven. Yep. We don't have to worry about this kind of stuff. And uh, if I, it's kind of like uh, little Bo Peep has lost her sheep, doesn't know where to find them. Leave them alone, and they'll come home. 
wagging their tails behind them. And that's what I believe. He says, I'm not that far advanced. I can't do that yet. He said, I got to do something about this stuff. I said, well, you better learn. Anyway, that'll do it for today. Does anybody have want to pick up a chip? Anybody who's got a birthday in November, a birthday? How many years? One. One year for the professor. We have the professor, we have the banker, and we have secret agent girl all sitting at the same table. How many years you got? Twelve. Twelve years. All right. Anything else? Anybody?